So now let's dive a little bit deeper, give you a little bit of teaser of what to expect when we talk about the economics of Nexus Mutual. So on a very high level summary, what is Nexus Mutual? Nexus Mutual is a decentralized insurance protocol that is on the Ethereum platform. And they what they do is they pull the different assets together to, as you can see, as you can imagine, you have your DAI, you have your Ether, you pull them together to be, and it's governed by all the different, the three types of users. You have the cover buyers, you have the risk assessor, and you have the claims assessor. So it's governed and created for these users and really managed by the users. So the coverage is really just the smart contract coverage, which is the internal technical risks. That will be the code. There'll be smart contract hacks, there'll be smart contract exploits, there'll be your different bugs in the code. So for example, a payout was in the B the BZX, the BZX exploit that happened a couple of months ago, where someone could exploit the code in the code in the, the smart contract, and the risk assessor said, yes, you could pay out, or yes, this is a risk and this is a bug and this is a smart contract problem. Yes, the, whoever that buys the risk can get a payout and the, and people do get a payout. How do you get access to NXM? This is a very interesting model then because NXM decides to go on the regulated way. So they're a, a UK registered mutual company. And so for anyone to be able to get the NXM token, you have to be KYC'd. So that means, you know, you have to send your, your passport information, you have to send your photo and everything. Once once that's done, you have to pay a small amount of membership. I think it's like 0 0.002 or 3 ETH. And you pay for the membership. And now you are part of a company, like you are part of a UK registered company for real. And that's why KYC is so important. And because you're now part of the company, now part of a UK registered company, you're part of the board of directors, you can get access to the NXM token. So you can get access to the platform in two ways. The first one is to buy coverage. So you can get a quote in seconds. You just have to put, you know, what kind of protocols you want to cover, how much money you want to, or how much assets you want to cover for, and duration of coverage. So, you, and then you get a, a quote in seconds. So that's done. And that's coverage. You can also get access to the NXM platform by purchasing the token itself. You can purchase it on the token, on the platform. And this is de defined by a bonding curve. You thought that we're done with bonding curves, right? Once, once we move to insurance? No. I think bonding curves is going to follow us for a very long time. I'm definitely going to talk about bonding curves in the next episode. So in this, in the NXM model, they use bonding curves in a different way. And the bonding curve is, you purchase bonding curve via the platform. And the bonding curve will, will define quite a lot of interesting dynamics. It's very wonderful. I will talk about it in the next episode. You can So you can only buy NXM token if your KYC buy them. However, I'm sure you've heard of this thing called um, WNXM, right? So there's a rep NXM that is tradable on secondary markets. NXM itself is not tradable. However, rep NXM is tradable on secondary market like Uniswap. So this Uniswap is able to... Uniswap, in Uniswap, you can trade like Ether for, for rep NXM and you can speculate on the price. You can only trade rep NXM for an actual NXM via a whole, like a KYC, a person who has KYC on the platform itself to get access to NXM, or you have to be KYC to be, to be doing that. So this is a whole new, like there's a secondary market for NXM that is not trading using NXM. That is also a very interesting economic model that we will talk about. So what does the NXM token do then? You know, what, what are the things to, what is the entire purpose of NXM token if it's not traded in the secondary market? Right, because the entire purpose of the NXM token is to be traded in the primary internal economy. What it does is with the bonding curve, again, the bonding curve, it balances the token prices with the collaterals that's available. So it, it changes, so the NXM price is not fixed all the time. It changes based on the amount of collaterals over there. So based on the amount of collaterals, it can cover more or less insurance, or it can provide more or less coverage. So if there's a lot of collaterals, then you have more funds to be able to covering to be covering more of these DeFi protocols, DeFi insurance. If there's less collaterals, then you just have to cover less. 
So if you think about it, the price of the tokens, the internal price of the token, so NXM price, not rep NXM. The NXM price is a signal to the information of how much people trust NXM and how, how much people are willing to use it. Remember I told you that all the way in the beginning, the insurance is about the economics of signaling. This is what I'm talking about. Because how do you, how do you share, how do you share the information that people are trusting your system? You can't just go around telling people, hey, buy my, buy my stuff because people trust it. It's like, okay, talk is cheap. So what this token does is that it becomes a signal to tell other people that, hey, my price of this token has grown because people are believing and trusting in my project and my protocol. So you should also trust it because so many people are trusting it. So this is a very interesting dynamics that we're talking about here because we are taking the same concept. Remember, in economics, the foundational concepts, the foundational principles don't change. So the economics of signaling doesn't change. But how we use economics of signaling in such insurance model in a new technolo technological stack is absolutely mind-blowing, right? Now, the token becomes a signal to how much people trust the system. The price of the token as well becomes a different kind of signal to the adoption rate of DeFi protocols. Think about it. In DeFi, we, it's super cool, right? In, in DeFi, you, you've got the total locked value, you have the prices of the tokens, you have this different matrix to understand the growth of DeFi. Good stuff. I like that. But to really understand how the mass population is adopting DeFi, you don't look at the total locked value because there's going to be a lot of double counting. You look at how, how risk averse people are. You look at the risk profile of people. If more people are purchasing insurance, then you know that they are more likely, they're probably, number one, probably probably making riskier investments. So it shows that they do have some faith in the system, but they're also a bit afraid of the risk, so they're buying insurance. Or number two, more people are coming into the space, and usually these are new people in the crypto space. So you want to be covered, you want your risk to be less, so you want insurance coverage and you get, the, and you get coverage with Nexus Mutual. And as more people get coverage with Nexus Mutual, the price of the tokens increase. So that also means that as more people come in, more people want coverage, it means that more people are using the DeFi protocols. And that's a good sign. It's a good sign because now it's a much, much, a much better matrix, a much better variable or signal to show what is the adoption rate of DeFi protocols. Because in total locked value, you could have a couple of wheels, make a big purchase, Purchase it there, leave it there, and that's it. And then wait for prices to go or rise and then do something else. But it's not real adoption. Real adoption rate, we, we look at Nexus Mutual because it's also, it's not just amount of coverage in terms of money, but also length of coverage. So that's a very interesting matrix to consider when you're looking at the adoption rate of DeFi. And lastly, how can you use the token? As much as the token is going to be a beautiful, you know, beautiful token to talk about signaling, to talk about moral hazards, to talk about law of large numbers. At the end of the day, you need to have actual use case of Nexus Mutual. So we talked about before with all the different participants, you could use it for staking, you could use it to be buying insurance coverage, you could be using it for governance, governance kind of mechanisms. So there are real use cases for Nexus Mutual tokens, and that's why it justifies the different value the different value according to the bonding curve with the amount of collaterals involved as well. So if you're, interest, if you're interested, we're going to talk a little, bit, a little bit more about that in the next episode. But I want to kind of wrap this up by talking about the future development of insurance in general. Because this is not it. What we're talking about here is just the beginning. It's just the beginning of insurance development and development of insurance in the crypto space. And this is getting really exciting. We're probably going to start looking at other risks to cover. So right now, we're just only looking at internal technical risk, right? Your smart contract, the bugs, the code. As I mentioned, soon we're going to start looking at the different external technical risks. So your layer one protocol, how will it affect your layer, layer two transactions? Stuff like your oracles, stuff like your governance attacks, stuff like your Byzantine attacks, stuff like your Sybil attacks. Once we can calculate these risks, once we can put a price to them, we can cover them. The other stuff will be your insurance types. You know, right now we're just looking at 
smart contract smart contract code insurance. There could be a lot of other insurance in the internal technical risk part, in the external technical risk part, in the economic incentive risk part, a lot of other insurance available. Then we also, we, I'm pretty sure we're going to see a lot of development in the insurance space. Right now in insurance, we have Nexus Mutual for the for the peer-to-peer -peer DeFi space. We have EtherRisk for the some flight flight insurance thing, which I don't know if it's still working because no one's taking flights anymore. We have the IBM, um, IBM, Musk, and EY kind of collaboration, which is which is where they use it's a it's a B two B two B kind of system, and they use blockchain as a immutable database, which is fine. But there are a lot of other ways we could look at the development in this space. So, for example, it could be using blockchain to underwrite the different risks with lower costs. So, if we start believing that blockchain it's an immutable database. We can trust the data there. We can trust the data there. We can underwrite risks a lot faster. So for example, this shipment is going from port A to port B. We have all the different risk timing. We have the profile of the ship. We have the profile of the ports. We have the profile of the goods. Then we can use smart contracts or, you know, these kind of business logics to be writing a risk, prim like a risk coverage just before the ship decides to leave the dock. So then it's, it's a lot more automated and things could could execute a lot faster. And if there's anything that happens, we have all these oracles that comes in, all this information that's being aggregated from the online and offline, off, on-chain and off-chain world coming together, interacting with each other, and then you can have a payout immediately. So there are a lot of developments in this space and I'm really, really excited. What about development in the crypto space specifically? Or the DeFi space? Because those could be just a B2B or B2B2B B2B B2B or, you know, in the institutional space. In the crypto P2P space, I would say right now, I know NFT is a big thing. NFT plus DeFi, even bigger. Now we put insurance in there. Insurance for NFTs. We talk about art pieces. These art pieces could be hacked. These, these art pieces could be stolen. Could we have insurance for them? Or could we, if you think about how insurance is being made, you have all these underlying insurance, right? Like AIG, AXA, AIA. And they would take some of this insurance stuff, repackage it up, and then sell it to other people. So that's what I could foresee some other people doing as well, where NXM is the underlying layer. And you have all these other parties coming in to repackage NXM into almost like an NFT, which is like a, a contract, like an insurance contract that can be resold or repurchased or purchased in fractions, which is also another pretty cool thing. So think of insurance agents as a new debt that sits on top of NXM. That's what I mean. And lastly, it's reinsurance. So if you've got someone sitting on top of NXM, you could also have other people sitting below NXM, which are in reinsurance in the space. And so these are a lot of new, interesting things that will come and should come very, very soon once we understand a little bit more about the risk profiles, how to price risk and all that kind of stuff. It is really, really exciting. So that's it for this episode. In the next episode, I'll dive deeper into... NXM into understanding the economics behind behind NXM, the different economic incentives in place, how the tokens work, and all the other super fun details that's going to come. If you have any questions of NXM, put them below so that I can address them in the next in the next episode. Till then, I'll see you in the next episode. And remember, if you want to get premium access, you could go to bit.ly forward slash econs design. It will bring you to the Patreon page where you could have different kind of access. You could also join the community if you want to have that kind of access to. Till then, I'll see you in the next episode. Bye!